Good morning. Pastor Bob Shetler of First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville here to say thank you for joining us this morning. At First Presbyterian, our purpose is to glorify God, make disciples of Jesus Christ, and meet human needs. I'm very pleased that you have chosen to take time from your busy schedule to worship the living Lord Jesus with us this morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you with us. Welcome, Carol. Vicki, come on up. Come on, come on up. Not come on down, but come on up. We're glad that you're here, and uh, we look forward to this, this time of worship together. We have a, a flower on the, the baptismal font for Virginia uh, Ruth Morris. Mom and Dad, Ben and Katie Morris, and Big Brother James. And so uh, we're very happy to have another addition to our family. And if you uh, run around today and you see someone new, uh, his name is Tony Cogdell. And Tony's our new head custodian. He'll be in Gordon Hall afterwards, and he's out doing his usual thing. But welcome, Tony. And here's the thing we're saying. Hey, he's the new guy in the block, so, you know, help him out. You, you know more about this place maybe than he does. So let's all be embracing and helping as he comes on board with us. This afternoon at uh, 4 o'clock, Dr. Coffey, along with the, uh, some of the faculty from the university, the Gainesville Brass Quintet, will be presenting a concert. So I hope that you will come if you are able this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And then a, a word about uh, news of the, the passing of Dr. Herman Tao. Uh, Dr. Tao was uh, a retired Navy, a dentist in the Navy, and uh, went home to be at the Lord on Friday. So we want to pray for uh, his wife, Eileen, and his daughter, Martha. Uh, services are still pending and probably will be just... Uh, in an ermit at Bushnell at the uh, cemetery for those who have served our country so faithfully. So we want to remember this family in our prayers, in our thoughts today. So with these things in mind, let us, uh, let us prepare our hearts for the worship of our Lord. Let us stand for our call to worship and our opening hymn number 155. Bless the Lord, O people, sing. 
Let the sound of praise ring out. Come and hear what the Lord has done. The Lord has made everything. Brothers and sisters, God not only asks us to repent, but also assures us of forgiveness. Therefore, let us confess our sins to the one who is steadfast in love together. Loving God, we do not always keep your commandments. We fail to love you. Our conscience is not clear. Wash us in the water of life that we may live again through the grace and mercy of Jesus, our resurrected Savior. Now, O oh Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence. Sisters and brothers, God forgives, restores, and strengthens us through the risen Christ. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This morning we have uh, one of our elders, Rick Smith, who is going to come and to share his spiritual autobiography. Part of the journey we've asked our session to be on, your session, your elders to be on, is to, is to read some materials on spiritual leadership, and one of the assignments we gave them was to write their own spiritual autobiography. 
So Rick has agreed to come and to share that with you in, in some fashion, a briefer fashion, but we've asked him to do that. And it all is in tandem with the sermon series around the power of story because our stories have power. And what Christ has done in our life is really ours, and we need to learn to share it. So Rick is going to do that this morning. Rick, thank you for being here and uh, come in, uh, and lead us in these moments as you uh, share with our congregation your spiritual autobiography, which was formerly known as a testimony, by the way, okay? My, my spiritual life is um, roughly in four seasons um, as it stands now. Since each season is about 20 years, I, um, I'm hoping to get another one or two seasons in before this is over. Um, I, uh, I'm going to highlight the transitions between the seasons. Those seem to be the times when I'm awake enough to recognize that God's trying to talk to me. Uh, I'm pretty sure that he's trying to do something in the other times, but I'm just not, or too dense to be aware of it. Um, I grew up in central Nebraska, a small town. My parents were Methodists. I was confirmed into the Methodist church, and by the time I graduated from high school, I told everyone I was an agnostic. I didn't believe. Um, that position was the one I held through college. And then um, in the fall of 1973, something big happened. I met a girl. Um, Jane and I were married shortly afterwards. Um, my wife is a um, evangelical Christian. She was then as well. She married me in a moment of weak will, I think. Uh, but um, not much really changed for me spiritually. I was uh, still an agnostic. Um, she did get me to go to church. So fast forward um, about 20 years. We have four children. Um, one, of the, one of the youngest is a ball player, and we're um, at a baseball game at Keystone Heights on a weekend. It's fairly late in the evening. And driving home that night, um, it was pretty late. Um, Scott uh, curled up in the seat and went to sleep. Um, I looked at him and I realized that he, uh, he had complete trust that I would get him home safely that night. And I asked myself, who's driving for me? When I'd answered that question, uh, I was a Christian. Um, the following 15 years were kind of a whirlwind. I threw myself into prayer. My, um, my thinking at the time was that um, if I'm going to have a relationship with Jesus, I should probably talk to him. Um, I learned how to share the gospel and did so numerous times, um, went on mission trips, and um, near the end of this particular phase, Jane and I became accidental church planters, and we um, attempted to plant a church in East Gainesville. Uh, it did take uh, for a while and, and um, was active until last October when the pastor died. Um, we showed up five years ago at the steps of First Pres, um, carrying some wounds uh, over the previous years, and um, Shortly after that, I had a stroke. The, um, the stroke affected a number of things, and it, uh, in particular, I felt that I had been robbed of some of my spiritual gifts by the stroke, and that angered me a great deal. The, um, the anger basically stayed with me until one day a neurologist was uh, showing 
me my brain scan and describing all the areas of my brain that were affected by the stroke and those that weren't. And I suddenly realized that I wasn't actually a victim in this that I'd been spared. So <clears throat> now at this stage, I'm just enjoying God's grace and claiming the promise that uh, my grace is sufficient and um, my power is revealed uh, through your weakness. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, our helper and advocate. Open our hearts, hearts and minds this day. Entice us with your presence. Spark us with a word of life, a message that we may share with others as we seek to live Christ's love in the world. All this we ask in the name of God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us. Amen. Today's gospel reading is from John 18, 15 through 18, and 25 through 27. Have you ever been humbled by a rooster? Peter was. Hopefully we all have, for it is in these moments of our life that our Lord seeks to help us understand that true strength is found in our weakness, because in our weakness, he is strong. Whereas we, like those in the Bible, might be quick to trust the strength of numbers, our own position, or our own power, Jesus' strength relied solely on the love of God and the obedience of God. May we, like Peter did, come to live a life strengthened by the Lord. Please hear the word of the Lord. Simon Peter and another disciple we're following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around the fire that they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. This is the word of the Lord.
At this time, all of the children are invited to the front for a time for young disciples. Afterward, children ages four through second grade are dismissed for Kids for God. All right, good morning, good morning, good morning. All right, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? I'm Jungle Jane, and I will be your safari adventure guide through the jungle today. You should see the looks on the faces. <laughs> I will be guiding you through our adventure. Now, we are going to need... <sighs> we'll take this. This will keep us safe. Keep us from getting screwed. You hold on to that for me. And in case there are bugs, we don't want them to bite this. You hold on to those. Hmm, keeps the sun off. Will you hold on to that for me, please? Oh, what else have we got here? Oh, one of you gets one. One of you gets the other. There you go. You can be prepared with that. And in case anything gets in our way, I'll hold on to these. All right, now, we are prepared. What are we prepared for? A jungle adventure. Now... In the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, we are also called to be prepared, but not in quite the same way. We are called to be prepared to give a defense for why we have the hope that we have in Jesus. So, if for our jungle adventure, we wanted to make sure we had a shirt, long pants, boots, a hat, some loppers in case anything gets in our way, what can we do to prepare ourselves if somebody wants to know why we have hope in Jesus, what can we do to prepare? Get long sleeves. We got our long sleeves for our jungle adventure. For Jesus, we can prepare through prayer. We can prepare through scripture reading. We can prepare through memorizing Bible verses. We can prepare through spending quiet time with God. All of those things help give us what we need to send us out on the greatest adventure that we're ever going to go on, life. They didn't think it was funny. Um, and we can then be ready to give a defense for the hope that we have in who? In Jesus. Will you bow your heads with me? Dear God, please help us to prepare to tell others about the hope we have in you. Amen.
First of all, let me say thank you to Rick for your story, for your transparency and your honesty with us in the great uh, spiritual autobiography. Thank you very much. Today, as we look at the power of story, we're going to look at the very interesting character in the New Testament, uh, Simon Peter. Uh, I'm always intrigued by him because of all the different uh, facets of faith that he brings to us. So as we begin, we look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3, verses 13 through 16, if you'll follow along with me. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ralph Winter, when he was director of the U.S. Center for World Missions, says, we do well to recognize what seems to be the the consistent thrust of the whole Bible, that unless and until in faith the future of the world becomes more important than the future of the church, the church has no future. As Jesus Christ put it, the most dangerous thing that you can do is to seek to save your own life, end of quote. It has been said that every church in history that has not reached out has gone down, but I see the church of Jesus Christ struggling more and more in our world to reach out. Part of the marching orders that God has given us so clearly stated by Jesus is this, if you save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake and the gospel's sake, you will find it. The church of Jesus Christ is called to bring a witness of Jesus and his salvation to the world. Peter writes these words out of what I call both a negative and a positive experience of speaking to others about Jesus Christ. What I want to do this morning is to look at the first Peter passage and give you four concepts that I believe that Peter gives us in that, and then I want to back out to his story of how he was pretty much a failure with one of his experiences of witnessing for Jesus Christ, and how he was a tremendous success on the other side. So from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 16, I find these four critical elements in how we face what Christ has called not your pastor just to do, but all of us to do, and that is take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world who needs his hope. Here are the four. Do not fear. Set Christ apart in your heart. Be prepared and do this with gentleness and respect. The first one, do not fear. When we give a reason for our hope, we should not fear, even if we suffer for our beliefs. Because Peter says, if you suffer, you'll be blessed. We are not to fear their threats or to be frightened. Peter's mentor put it this way, and in case you don't know who his mentor was, it was Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. When we give a reason for our hope, we are not to fear. The second one is, we are to set Christ apart in your heart. This really means to honor Christ as holy. The Lord Almighty is the one we are to regard as holy. We are to honor Christ, our Lord, in our hearts. And the first and most important way to set Christ apart in our hearts is to see the difference between Jesus Christ being our Savior and Jesus Christ being our Lord. When Jesus Christ is our Savior, he brings us salvation. But when he becomes our Lord, he is our master, our owner, our guardian. And this calls us to total devotion to him. 
my friend and the founder of Campus Crusade, which is now known as Crew, Bill Bright, used to tell it this way when he would say, when Jesus Christ comes into your life as Savior, he is in there. But what happens to most of us is we still want to be on the throne. We still want to be in charge. We still want to be in control. But when he becomes our Lord, he is the one on the throne. And within our heart, we still set him apart and bow and worship to him. In setting him apart, we are uh, to have a life of obedience. To set Christ apart means that we honor him and only him, to recognize him in worship. The heart is the center of the personality. It controls the intellect. It controls the emotions. It controls the will, and it sure has an impact upon our spirituality. And when we allow him to be Lord, all of those are impacted positively in our lives. The third one is be prepared. I guess if you could put an understudy on this, it would be be a Boy Scout, right? They're the ones who are always supposed to be prepared. So he says, be prepared. Always be in a state of preparedness or readiness to give a reason for your hope. You should know what you believe and why you believe it. So if I put an asterisk right there, if I do a sideboard, I would say, if you remember, perhaps one or two of you might remember, I did a series of sermons just a few months ago on why you believe. Not what you believe, but why you believe. And I did that to set us up for this time that when you start talking about taking your faith of Jesus Christ to your friends, to your family, to the world, that you will have a basis for the understanding and that you will be prepared. You should know what you believe, why you believe it, and be willing and able to share it. The call to preparedness by Peter is expressed as a time of urgency. When Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and we go through crisis, it becomes an opportunity for us to witness to those around us. And we should always be ready to give an answer for why we believe that he is the hope for the world. There's an interesting word here that Paul uses in Greek that we get our word apology from. And apology didn't always mean to say, I'm sorry. It really meant for a presentation in a courtroom to defend what you believe. That's where we get the branch of theology called apologetics. When you say someone is an apologist, you're not saying that they go around, I'm so sorry that I believe in Jesus. No, they're going around and telling people why they believe in Jesus and what that means. Every Christian should be able to give a reasonable defense. Every crisis in our life and the lives of others gives us a chance to witness and to believe and to share where our hope is founded. And we must be able to do this with a reasonable ability. The struggle we have sometimes is that we want to have a secondhand faith. And believe me, secondhand faith doesn't work. You want to know why I believe that? Because I failed at secondhand faith. When I was in college, I was trying to live off the faith of my parents, and it was secondhand. Let me tell you what, faith cannot be inherited. It must come from God. It must be yours. And when you understand that it's your faith, it's your story, just like Rick gave us, that's his story. And he's an expert at it. And he can use that to tell other people firsthand what it meant to change from being an agnostic, becoming a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. Hope here is defined not as I hope that I get this for Christmas or I hope that something will happen that I have no control over. Hope defined here is the desire for some future good with the expectation of attaining it. Our hope in Jesus Christ is a sure assurance that he resurrected, that he ascended, and that he will be back for us and that at his resurrection power, lives can be changed. Looking forward to something, towards something, confident that it will be fulfilled. G.K. Chesterton puts it this way, hope means hoping when when things are hopeless or it is no virtue at all. If I frame that for me in sharing faith with somebody, it'd be the people that I've shared about Jesus Christ to them thinking, man, there's no way this person is going to accept Jesus Christ. That's when we seem hopeless, but it's through his hope that I've seen those people come to faith in Jesus Christ. As long as matters are really hopeful, Chesterton said, hope is mere flattery on the platitude. It's only when everything else is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. Or as Gabriel Morel says, hope is for the soul what breathing is for living organisms. And if we really live with the hope, does that mean my soul is going to be alive and a breathing organism that's stronger? 
And then Peter says, look, when you do this, I used to use the term, don't bruise the fruit. Don't pick it before it's ready. But do it with gentleness and respect. It's, it's the idea that we're not impressed with our story, but we're impressed with the fact of what God has done for us. And when you share your faith in Jesus Christ, it's not about you, it's about Him. And when you do it, you should do it with gentleness and respect. Respect means reverence. The literal meaning is that we should be very, very respectful because the material we're dealing with is incredibly important. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, he gives us these four things, and I think they come from his experience of a failure in a witness and then a success in a witness. Let me tell you what, when I was 23 years old, I was hired by a church to be a youth pastor, and I had no clue what I was doing. Now, some of you may think the same today, but that's all right. But, but the idea behind this is, when I went out to witness, I mean, I didn't have any idea, so I went to the local bookstore, Christian bookstore, and I asked that guy, I said, man, can you help me? And he began to lead me, and he actually led me to Bill Bright's materials, which I used for years and years and years, and then finally had a chance to be his pastor at one time. And it was kind of a, an awestruck thing when he came in one Sunday and said, I want to become a member of this church. And then after you've done those materials, you meet the author, and you have a different perspective. It's just like the Bible. When you meet the author, you read the Bible a whole lot different than you did before. And so in that, the Scriptures give us this experience. The first one Breezy read for us this morning. It's right after Jesus had been in the upper room with the disciples. It's right after he had been in the garden. And they couldn't pray with him for an hour. And, and they come, and they're going to arrest him. And Peter tries to cut off the ear of one of the guys. And, and after that, he's taken to the courtyard, and he's asked twice, you know, were you a disciple? It's not a theological question. It's just basically, are you a follower of Jesus? And he denied it. I am not. I am not. And then the last one, he says, you know, um, no, not me. And then he heard this sound in the background. Can you imagine that sound, the rooster crowing? He goes, oh, man, I did it, didn't I? Because Jesus told him, you're going to do this. So why did Peter deny Jesus? It's a good question. It was not a really good night, was it? His leader was on trial, and, and he, was, he was running scared, if I can say that. Here's the second setting. The second setting comes after the resurrection. The second setting, <clears throat> excuse me, comes after the ascension. The second setting comes after the day of Pentecost. The second section or testimony or witnessing comes after the great sermon that 3,000 people came to faith. And we find Peter and John again. In fact, that's who he's with when he denied Jesus. If you go back and read the Gospel of John, and if you want to know who John is, he's the one who says, and they're constantly the one whom Jesus loved. He never names himself in his Gospel. But I think all of us ought to take on that title, don't you? I'm the one whom Jesus loved. I love that title. And so here we are, Peter and John, they're going out, they heal this beggar who was lame from birth, and the man gets up and he starts leaping and jumping and praising God and he draws a crowd and then they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and John and Peter, Peter are joined in and telling the people that, that they're teaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and they're interrupted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees came upon them and said, you can't do this and they arrested them. Very similar to what happened to Jesus. Same place, some of the same people. And so they're put in jail, Peter and John put in jail. Let me tell you what, if I got put in jail, most of you say, you no longer have the right to be the pastor of this church. Do you agree? Well, here we got two guys that Jesus talks about in the Bible that were put in jail. Dr. Luke gives us the account. And let me tell you what, the more I study the Bible, the more I find that, that God does not hide the ugliness of some of the people he called to be the leaders. Did you notice that? It tells us a couple of things. One is God wants us to be transparent about those things. And the second thing it tells us is what? He uses us wherever we are and whoever we are because we all got faults and failures. So here they are. The next morning they get up and they're taken, as Dr. Luke says, the next day the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, was there. Sapphira was there. John was there. Alexander, the high priest, and his family were there. And they told Peter and John that they needed to come before them and be questioned. And they said, by what power and by what name did you do this? And Peter uses what he gives us in 1 Peter. He didn't have any fear. 
because he says to them, although they were on trial for intimidating the council, Peter turns and puts them on trial. That's pretty good defense, isn't it? Pretty good apologetic. Not to be ugly or not to do it in gentleness or respect, but turning by saying, wait a minute, this is what I believe. And he does that showing them and points out that it was not a crime to do something good to heal a cripple. And then he says, because you, speaking to them, crucified Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, and in whose name the lamb man had been healed. You see that? He was not only not fearful, he had planned out the key point, and the key point is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Rulers and elders of the people, he says, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and we are being asked on how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Let me tell you what, as I said the sermon last Sunday, there's two great miracles that Jesus gave in that story of the paralytic man, and the first one was the miracle of the forgiveness of sins. And we must never forget that only comes through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then Peter goes on to give a little gentleness and respect here. And he says, let me just tell you what salvation is all about. Verse 12, Acts 4. <clears throat> salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind whereby we must be saved. You see the two experiences of Peter? Let me ask you something. I bet all of us have lived both of those. Have you ever walked out of a conversation with somebody and you, should have, and you think, man, I should have said this. And someone asks you about what you believe and what you're doing, and you say, man, I should have said that. All of us have had those failures. Let me tell you the two key ingredients that I think were the difference between the, the failed experience and the successful experience. And we have both of them. One is, is the power of God's Holy Spirit that came upon Peter after Pentecost. And if you're a Christian and you're not living in the power of God's Holy Spirit, then you're missing the best part of the Trinity in some aspects, in my opinion, of the day that we live in today. The Holy Spirit, the unforgotten God, the Holy Spirit who was given us to be strengthened for us, that was one of the differences. And the second difference was, was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Peter may have grasped in his mind that Jesus was going to be crucified, and maybe that's why he failed at those three times of saying, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. But then when the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him, that he was successful in being a witness for Jesus Christ. And when you say, I can't do it, then go back and look at this and remind yourself, I have the Holy Spirit, and I also have the history and the understanding and the knowledge of one of the most documented events in the history of our world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Tim Mullenhoff writes in the Discipleship Journey, and if you want some help with your witnessing, write these four things down very briefly. I'm not going to elaborate on them. I'm just going to give them to you. First of all, when you start talking to people, you need to look for these key questions. What does this person believe? And you know what? I cannot... It's like your doctor. When you go to your doctor, man, they ask you all these questions. Boom, 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 boom. They ask you right? They want to know where you are. Does that make sense? Same thing here. When you begin to witness somebody, just don't get your little rote memorization out and don't be a telemarketer. I love telemarketers when they call me and I can start asking them questions. It gets them all confused. And then I ask them, I said, by the way, could I have your home phone number so I can call you during supper and interrupt your dinner? You know, don't be a telemarketer. Come and understand where they are so you can connect where they are in their faith belief. You just can't start from zero. You have to start where they are. The second thing, though, is begin to figure out and know why these beliefs seem to be right for this person. What's their background? Why do they believe this? And then the third one is find where you agree with them so that's something you can build off of. And the fourth one is begin to see what are the next steps that you can begin to take that person towards faith in Jesus Christ. And here's the problem we have, and us pastors are the worst about it. We want to close the deal in the first meeting, and that's not the way sales always go. Abdu Murray, one of the, the speakers for the Rabbi Zacharias International Group, is a converted Muslim. 
He said the journey was nine years. You know, for most of us, we would have given up. Let me speak for me. I probably would have given up. But that's where we need to understand the true meaning of evangelism is sharing Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and leaving the results to God. Continue to do that. Now, in your worship guide this morning, I've given you a little blue card. Have you seen this before? Let me ask you, have you used it before? This is an instrument that you can give to people and not just invite them to come to the open forum, but to bring them to the open forum. Bring them. Because as I tell the team I'm working with on this, the follow-up starts at the invitation. If I'm the one who brings them, then I need to continue that follow-up. There's an old saying about that. You need to dance with the one you brung. You know what I'm talking about? And so in that, there's also a guide here I've given you in the worship guide of some of the points I use in my own life of beginning to ask God to reveal people I need to witness to, beginning to pray for them, beginning to, to give reasons for why I believe and beginning them to show the faith in Jesus Christ. I know I'm going a little long this morning, but y'all just bear with me. Um, so from this, I just want to share with you... Uh, just a quick story. In some of our, our planning for this, and by the way, I just want you to know, you're invited to this open forum. And not only are you invited, don't come alone. Bring somebody with you. It's building momentum. We've, uh, we've been very, very thankful for what God is doing and for the many churches that are going on. We've got people in Ocala who come in and joined us and want to know. We've got people in Jacksonville and Orlando and Tampa area who are saying we're bringing people. And if you miss this event, I, I hate to say it to you, you're going to miss one of the greatest, I think, spiritual events in the, in the history of this community. So I hope that you will be there. In my experience of working this, I've had a lot of breakfast and lunch meetings. And in, in one of the places we went, there was a person there who, who had helped us with that meeting and didn't know their faith background or where they were from or where they were spiritually. And so I just, before I left that morning, I handed one of these cards to him and I said, I'd really like for you to come with, to this. And then I went back a couple of weeks later to the same place and I, I said, remember that card I gave you? And they said, yeah, you know, I've got it on my dresser and I'm coming. And because of my involvement, I said, then I'm going to get somebody to come with you. And I worked that out. And from that perspective, what I'm saying to you is it may take two or three or four of us to get someone there. But folks, let me tell you, it's not just about Rabbi Zacharias, it's not about RZIM, it's not about what we're doing. It's about every day of worship, it's about every day of bringing people to church, it's about bringing people to Jesus Christ, and there are instruments we have to use to bring people to that understanding. My prayer is that you will be willing enough, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, be willing to boldly step out to your family and your friends and say, would you come with me? That's the message of being prepared and always being ready to give a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. What would have happened if the 12 disciples would have stayed in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came and they stayed in that room? We would not be here today. And our responsibility is to continue to tell this message to the next generation. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Let us now stand and affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he should come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated.
Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, first of all, we want to thank you for, uh, for your, your love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, before we even created, God had a plan for this redemption through Jesus Christ, and we want to praise you for that. We want to praise you for being the creator and the recreator. We want to thank you for the redemption you give us in Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, we confess when we have failed to, to be the instruments of, uh, of grace and mercy, bringing the hope of Jesus Christ to the world. And so, Lord, in these days, I pray that your spirit would move amongst this congregation and throughout the one church in Gainesville, the church of Jesus Christ, whether it's a church like this or it's a home church or maybe it's a campus Bible study, Lord, that the, the power of God's Holy Spirit would move in this community and we would see lives change and people coming to faith and, and Christians encouraged and the church of Jesus Christ becoming stronger. So, Lord, I thank you for this church having the vision to, to look at what we need to do locally through, through this ministry and through these days, but also, Lord, we're reminded of what you're doing in Nicaragua with a, a, a seminary that uh, even, even this Sunday people are preparing and preaching and talking about training up leaders, over a hundred who've agreed to come to seminary classes to be better educated and trained to take the gospel of Jesus Christ in a, in a section, in a community of, of Nicaragua, in Esteli, where we have been there for many years. And now, Lord, we see a great outpouring of your spirit. So help us to be faithful, not just to think about them, but to pray for them and encourage them as they do this. But today, Lord, we're also burdened by the passing of one of our faithful uh, Dr. Taos, Lord, we pray for, uh, for Eileen, and we pray for, uh, for Martha. We pray for the time that, that your spirit can minister to them in their grief. But Lord, we also pray today for, for Richard and for Carolyn, for Fred, uh, for Trudy, for many who need your healing hand today, that you would be upon them, and that we might be instruments of your grace and mercy. But Lord, I pray for the friends around us that we need to embrace not with just the things we talk about every day, but with the things that are most important about Jesus Christ and the meaning of what God has given to us in origin and to the meaning of life and to morality and to, to our destiny. So, Lord, in these days we lift up Rabbi Zacharias and Vince Vitale and the team around them for the week of mission at UF in February, for the forum in January, for all those who are working on it, Father God, we pray that we would see your spirit in a mighty way in your people in this place. But Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the faithfulness of people in coming and giving and ministering. So Lord, help us to remember it's not just about coming to worship, but it's about going into the mission field and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God, knowing that you have called us to be people of the Spirit and people of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Take these words and use them. Take these times that we share together and we minister together for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. And there's a fellowship pad at the end of each pew if you give us a record of your attendance. And then also I remind you as we worship God that we are about in this moment, in this time in this church, I think more than ever since I've been here, not just about being church, but about being involved in the kingdom work that God is doing. Let us worship God with our tithes and offerings for his kingdom and his glory.
refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Father, we know that so many times we live both sides of Peter, more so on a daily basis. There are moments that we deny you with our lips as well as our actions. But Lord, you remind us of your grace and your mercy and how you make us new every single day. In our newness, Lord, in your fullness, may we proclaim your name in such a way that people don't just see us for who we are, but they see you. Let us be a light on a hill for all to see. So Father, as we go forth, may we proclaim your name from the rooftops, remembering the words in which your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The invitation today is uh, very simple but expanded. First of all is I, I pray that you have personally for yourself determined where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That could be not a believer, it could be one who says I'm saved, or it could be one who says he's the Lord of my life. Either case I invite you if you have not come to Jesus Christ to come to receive him as your savior. If you're a Christian and do not have a church home, even if you're a student, this is a place for you. We, we provide opportunities for you to be what we call affiliate members, where you can keep your membership in your home church, but be a member here while you're in college or in graduate school, and then be a full-fledged part of what we're doing. So I invite you to consider that. But the third step today is, what are you gonna do with the message that we just received today? Are you going to tuck it away and say, yeah, yeah, it's okay? Are we going to take it to heart and say, I know of this person in my sphere of influence that I need to begin to ask some of those questions about what they believe and why they believe it and how we can make that journey together. So I invite you to consider taking that journey with others. If you would like to receive Christ or talk about membership or need prayer, Jed Keesling and Ray Davis are going to be here to greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you will allow the Spirit of God to be heard in your heart today and give you direction as Lord of your life of what you need to do. By the way, in your spare time this week and next week, pray for these events, if you would. May the living Lord Jesus go with you today. May he go above you to watch over you, beside you to hold your hand, 
behind you to watch your back, underneath you to be your stability, within you to bring you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen. Again, let me thank you for joining us in our worship today at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville. I invite you to come on Sunday and join us personally at 1055 in our sanctuary at 106 Southwest 3rd Street in downtown Gainesville. We have other ways to be involved in the ministry offerings of First Presbyterian Church, children's ministry, music ministry, a ministry with college students. You can reach us at 352-378-1527 or on the web at 1stpc.org.